morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to DTN's uh, 2023 uh, winter seasonal outlook webinar. I am your host, Andrea Berg, and I will go over some housekeeping items and then turn it over to our forecasters. So we are recording today's session. We will be sending out a link to the recording with uh, everyone on this call and everyone who registered. Um, hopefully by the end of this week, probably early next week uh, when it's available. Um, if you are having any technical difficulties, please contact me using the chat feature or the Q&A feature. And we have reserved some time at the end of the webinar for any questions. And so please use the Q&A feature um, to ask those questions at any time throughout the presentation. So our presenters today, uh, we have three great presenters. First, Nathan Hamblin. He is one of our weather risk communicators focusing on long range forecasts. We have Steven Strum. He is uh, one of our senior managers in weather risk, also uh, focusing on long range forecasts. And then Troy Vincent, he is one of our senior DTN um, market analysts. So with that, I am going to turn the presentation over to Nathan. Nathan, it's all yours. Thank you, Andrea, and welcome everybody. We're gonna go over a quick review of the last winter season, highlights of winter of 2022-2023, and then we're gonna go over some of the forecasting techniques that we use, the ENSO outlook and analog patterns, which is our statistical forecast approach. And then we'll take a little look at the polar vortex and see what we expect out of that this season. And then we'll compare all that to what the computer model projections are showing us. And then we're gonna wrap that up into a seasonal outlook November through March, 2023, 2024, and we'll include a heating degree day outlook. And then we're gonna go further and let you know how that impacts you in different industries, including utilities, aviation, transportation, and offshore. And then we will go over some oil and gas impacts. So let's start with a review of last year's highlights. And looking at the winter jet stream on the right-hand side, you see those yellow colors across the southwestern part of the country that they went through the northeast. That is enhanced jet stream winds. In other words, that's where the storm track generally was. And where you see the, the purple colors where it's weaker, the storm track was not there. Um, and that was primarily caused by a moderate La Nina, which created that stronger jet stream. And we had a short-lived Arctic air, uh, air mass that occurred across the central and eastern United States in December, right just, right just before Christmas, hard to forget that. But then we followed it up with well above average temperatures in January and February, and some of that was of the record variety, so very extreme on both ends. And we had a lot of rain and mountain snow across the southwestern part of the country, especially later in the season. And then we had heavy snow that impacted the upper Midwest and Northern Plains and part portions of the interior Northwest. Looking at winter temperature departures, a map on the left, you see all those orange colors in the east, well above average temperature, especially closer to the coast that you got. By contrast, in the western part of the country where you see the blues, we had below average temperatures and that extended out into the northern plains to at least some extent. And on the right, we had precipitation anomalies from November through March. And where you see the blues, that's where above average precipitation occurred. The reds means below average precipitation. And it was, it was pretty active for a lot of the country with the exception of the Pacific Northwest, portions of Texas through Kansas, and then portions of the East Coast were spared. But other than that, it was a very wet winter, especially true in California and, of course, and near the Great Lakes. Looking at it by month, November was very cool in the western part of the country, especially the northern plains and the northern Rockies. It was above average, closer to the eastern seaboard. Uh, December, well, it was weighed down heavily by that cold shot in the uh, northern Rockies through the north central part of the country, took the brunt of that, but even into the east, that weighed everything down to below average. However, near the Gulf Coast and portions of northern Maine into the Canadian Maritimes, that was not the case, it was above average. And then you can see January and February, the script flipped entirely and uh, above average temperatures were, were observed for most of the country and especially in January, and the eastern part of uh, the U.S. was almost record warm. 
And uh, February mostly continued in the east, but some coolness started to build across the western part of the country. And in March, they expanded into the central part of the country, while the east remained at least mild. Precipitation, a lot of green on the map for November. Northern U.S. for the most part, and then portions of Florida, but then it was very dry in the Ohio and Tennessee valleys. December was active for almost everybody. January was active for almost everybody as well, with the exception of Oklahoma and Texas through probably Louisiana. And then February active in the north in the north central part of the country in the Midwest through the Mid-Atlantic. And then the West Coast took a break and the Gulf Coast was dry. And then March, and especially in April, it was very active, especially the Ohio and Tennessee valleys and the West Coast, especially California. Snow totals. Um, we see the map on the right, you see the, the snowfall anomalies, which tell you the most I, on the map like this. And where you see the blues, that is above average snowfall. Where you see the oranges, that's below average. And the western part of the country, especially in the mountain areas, uh, above average. And this is especially true across the northern Rockies through the upper Midwest. And of course, the mountainous areas from the Sierra through the Four Corners region, very, very active year. By contrast, it was not an active year at all, especially from the northeastern urban corridor down through the Ohio Valley and then much of the east, uh, well below average snow. So quite the contrast across portions of the country. So let's take a look a little bit more recent. Um, August temperatures were well above average in the southern plains and along the west coast, especially the Pacific Northwest, but it was below average across the northeast. And then Precipitation very dry from the upper Midwest to the southern plains of the Gulf Coast region, a little bit more active along the East Coast. And one won't be able to forget Hurricane Hillary making landfall as, as a tropical storm just below California and then sending a lot of precipitation across Southern California and into the interior West. In September, just another summer month for the central part of the country, well above average temperatures, especially in Texas. A little bit above average along the eastern seaboard and a little below average in California and precipitation very dry from Michigan southward through the Ohio, Tennessee Valley and into Texas above average. In the northwestern part of the country through the northern plains. And in the northeast also above average. October today, and this is to include everything that has occurred and will occur in the next week to, to close out the month. Above average temperatures, at least for the most part. Uh, across the country, and it's going to turn out to be a little bit colder across the northern Rockies as this winter white like shot is going to come in in the next few days and wipe out all the warmth that occurred earlier in the month. Precipitation above average from Texas through the northern plains and the northern Rockies dry for most other areas. So we took a look at when the coldest 90 day period of the year occurs in the US and across the western part of the country, it begins near or just after Thanksgiving and uh, that and it extends all the way through the end of February. Now, the Northeast, on the other hand, it kind of arrives a little bit later. So you see the blue is uh, the coolest, the coldest uh, 90 day starts in some first week of December and in some cases, the second week of December, especially across Maine. But what I want to call your attention to here to the bottom is the 10 year averages for some of these months. I'll notice here that December has, has been warm and average above normal. The 90, in the 1991 to 2020 averages, it's averaged above normal for the past 10 years. So the idea here, especially in the east, is that the winter started off a little bit slower overall. But if you look at February and especially March, you can see uh, some of the coolness is lingering to, or being observed later in the winter. This is especially true across the upper Midwest and northern plains. So some, even though it says, uh, you know, we've taken it into account to a certain extent um, in, in the graphic above, Winters recently have been starting a little bit later and ending a little bit later in the Northeast, and that very well could keep going. So while that, let's go into the seasonal forecast. And our winter seasonal influencers are not limited to this, but the Enso state, either La Nina or El Nino, and that's typically 40% of the deal, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on its strength. And the polar vortex, 30%. And Sometimes it can be uh, wait, it can weigh down on the forecast heavily, and we have fair skill. We can we're pretty good at figuring out if there's going to be one, if the conditions are right. But in order in order to determine exactly when there will be one, that's very difficult from a seasonal standpoint. Sub seasonal things like the Madden Julian oscillation, 
where snow cover is, things like that. Um, that's a, a small, it weighs on the forecast small. We have pretty low skill from a seasonal standpoint. That's more a weekly standpoint that we can forecast stuff like that. And of course, we can look out the window and see what the trends are and those types of things get baked into the forecast as well. So let's take a look at the main seasonal drivers like we always do. And the thing that stands up off the map is the red colors you see closer to South America in the tropical Pacific Ocean. That is an El Nino. And this is quite different because for the past three years in a row, prior to this one, we had La Nina's in place. So we have a definite difference in the pattern there. However, we do have a negative phase of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which means warm water is forecast to be in the North Pacific Ocean with relatively cooler water closer to the West Coast. And then we're positive AMO, we have very, very warm, extreme levels of warmth actually in the North Atlantic Ocean. So what we try to do is go into the historical record and look for years that had similar ocean temperature profiles to this year. And that can kind of give us some clues as to where it might be going. The UNSO forecast through, through uh, next summer, um, the maroon line there is the average of all these forecast centers trying to forecast UNSO from all across the world. And uh, you see here it is going to peak out here over the next month or two, and then it will decline during the winter season, as it typically does. Most La Nina's weaken during the January through March period. So um, pretty good agreement on that. There's some differences in some of the strength. So some of them are very, very strong, like 2015 and 1997, and some of them are, are not quite as strong. But just about all of them show a strong La Nina as we define it as above 1.5 degrees Celsius. So pretty high confidence get going into the at least the first half of the season. Well, and what, what, what does an El Nino type tell you about, about what's coming and how does that compare to this year? Well, look at where the warmest temperature anomalies are forecast to be this year by the model guidance. And all the models show this. The warmth is supposed to be closer to South America uh, as opposed to in the Central Pacific. So look at the the image on the right there, you can see where the warmth is more or less closer to the South American coastline. We call that an East Bay El Nino. And some of the events like 1982, 1997, and 2015 fell into this camp. And the central base one is where the warmth is closer to the date line. So it's a little bit cooler than the South American coastline, but warmer near the date line. And those type of events yield different results. Um, winters like 91, 94, et cetera, 2009, 2010 come comes into mind on that, and they fall into that camp. So what does it mean? Well, during the fall, you see the warmth closer to South America during the East Base events, kind of what's been like it's been observed now, and it stays there during the winter season. There, we have the Central Base events on the bottom, you see the warmth is already in, in the fall, more into the central part of the basin as opposed to closer to South America, it stays that way during the winter season. And then here's, here's the difference it tends to make with temperature departures. Notice here the December, January, and February, East base on the top, central base on the bottom. And both in both cases, December it typically turns out very warm. So we have pretty high confidence in that. The only cooler places will be in the southwestern part of the country. And in January, it's a whole lot of difference. You see uh, some of the warmth in the southeast starts to go away, gets to be near to even slightly below average. And east and central both show that, still warm in the north. However, February and March, which is not shown here, uh, this is where you see the biggest differences. So when you have these base events, the warmth tends to continue, even though it does move westward a little bit into the north central part of the country, it does continue. And it's still, it can get a little bit cooler in the southeast, but it typically continues. But look at what happens when you have a central based event. It, it opens the door for some late season cold, and we're kind of watching that. Because if the model guidance isn't right, and that one starts to go trickle back towards the date line, we might have an exciting end to the winter season. So it's something to keep in a very close eye on. So let's take a look at what our analogs show and average weather conditions from previous years with similar ocean temperature patterns that are expected this year. And here's what the analogs, the analogs that we chose in order and um, no surprise which ones are gonna be on there. Some of the big El Nino years and then some of the ones that were in the central base there in there, around there too, just in case. But we have them weighted by how close they're going to be. And the thick black line is the average here. So the our, our forecast in, in the, is pretty close to what the average is here, getting up close to a plus two at the peak and then drifting off later in the winter season. 
And uh, we think we've covered most of the possibilities with these analogs. The sea surface temperature analogs do show uh, the east based El Nino with all that warmth near South American coastline spread westward a little bit. And uh, a few other things. Now, some thing got to remember looking at this is that there's a lot more warm water out in the world right now than during some of the years that we had to choose. So, no analog is going to be perfect. But what it does show is some of the warmth there. And it also shows some warmth in the Western Indian Ocean that's going to be expected this year. So, we have at least some bases covered with these analogs. This is going to be kind of a unique year considering how much warmth there is in the oceans across the world. Jet stream analogs. Now, remember, in the earlier graphic, we showed it going from the southwest U.S. to the northeast this year, not so. This year, the analog shows something much different. Uh, a lot of those reds where the stronger jet stream is will be across the far southern part of the country, and then a weaker jet stream across the northern part of the country and towards Alaska. So uh, what this is going to tell me, and what should tell everybody, is that the jet stream is going to be further south, and the storm track will also be further south could be a more active solution across the southern U.S. and into the Gulf of Mexico. So looking at individual months, and then we'll wrap up the season. Uh, the analogs are have a, kind of have a cold look for November, which is probably not going to be right. And some of these years had some pretty decent cold in there, which is kind of weighing it down. So short-term cold shots can weigh in. I think that's what's being shown here, is that potential. Precipitation active across the southern U.S., not so much in the Pacific Northwest, Northern Plains, and into eastern Canada. December shows what you would, might expect based on what the graphic we saw earlier. Uh, well above average temperatures in northern plains to the eastern U.S., below average in the southwest. And then precipitation quite active, especially across the south, and maybe not so much across the Pacific Northwest or New England. January um, shows above average temperatures in the northern part of the U.S. and some coolness building in the south. Uh, precipitation closer to average partial in the northern plains, but active across the west coast, active up near the Gulf Coast and along the east coast, and then below average in the Great Lakes and the Ohio Valley. February, now note here that it does get a little bit cooler along the east coast, and then cooler in the southeast and south central, and then you start to see some of that more back into the north central part of the country. So not all that much different than our east base El Nino composite. Uh, precipitation. West coast, especially California, and then the southeast along in along the east coast, above average in precipitation, and that could mean coastal systems. We'll, we'll get to that in a moment. But what also uh, would show is below average precipitation from the Ohio Valley into the Great Lakes. March, above average in the north, below average in the south with temperature, and in precipitation looks very active with the exception of the Ohio Valley. So we we'll wrap this up into December, through February, the three month average showing above to well above average temperatures in the north, especially in the northern plains, and below average temperatures in the southwest through the Gulf Coast. Precipitation active in the south, not as active in the north, especially the Great Lakes and the northern Rockies. And what's, what does El Nino do to snowfall? Now, what I see here, or what I have here on the left hand side is, is, uh, there are two graphics, the first of which the top is the strong El Nino years. So some of the very top end of the El Nino spectrum and then all El Nino years on the bottom. And where you see the, the browns there, brown colors, that is reduced snowfall. And you can see for most of the northern U.S., no matter what case you choose, it is reduced snowfall. So that helps give you some confidence in that. But if we were to reduce the strength in El Nino, all of a sudden you start to see some of these blues creep in a little bit, especially in the northeastern part of the country. So... You already, the other thing you also see is an increased snowfall in both, in, in both cases across the mid Atlantic through the Appalachian. So, something to watch there as well. Uh, Western Texas through the Four Corners region active. So, the stronger the El Nino is, the more active it is in the Southwest. So, those are a few things that stood out. Top six snowfall anomaly analogs. So, we took our top six analogs here. And the thing you notice here is that the all six cases in the in the four corners region through West Texas, typically above average in snowfall. So I give you some confidence. And then all six cases, the Great Lakes in the Ohio Valley, below average snowfall for the most, at least for the most part. If you have some, uh, 2009, 2010 is the only exception to that. And uh, the thing about the East Coast is that, especially if you look at the bottom three here, uh, there is the opportunity for some snowfall there because a lot of times in El Nino, 
when you get into the, la the February, March period, there are opportunities for some larger events, some coastal systems that you typically don't get with La Nina. So those larger events can weigh in the seasonal averages, even if it starts out slow. So that'll be the thing we're watching along the East Coast, but below average uh, from the Midwest and especially the upper Midwest, Northern Plains, Northern Rockies for the most part. Polar vortex, let's talk about that. And uh, comes in a couple varieties. The one on the left is a strong, stable polar vortex with a nice pulp, strong jet stream, keeping it all bottled up. And those are usually milder patterns, but you can get weaker periods of the polar vortex and where that jet stream can buckle a little bit and you get some ridges and troughs. And that's when uh, colder air can move southward into those troughs. You can get blocking patterns that set up and wherever that is, I can determine where these little cold pools can, can locate. And sometimes extreme cold can follow the polar vortex disturbance, depends on where it goes. And prediction time, at least for the details, are limited to under two weeks. But we're still, like I said earlier, we can still figure out if there's, you know, if, if the season's at least favorable for such a disturbance. Looking at some of the analogs, maybe we get a clue out of that. Um, looking for a stronger high pressure, these orange and red colors near the pole, and you don't see a whole lot of that, especially in December. You see a lot of uh, the, the purple colors, so reduced risk of polar vortex disturbance in December. In January and February, you see a lot of ridging across Canada, but near the pole, it's kind of, we kind of see some attempts here and there, but it's not a definitive signal. So at least there's a reduced risk of major polar vortex of eruptions, disruptions during the strong El Nino events. It's not a 0% chance. There are, there are some chances and it has happened before, but it's not quite as often as if you had a weaker event. Let's compare that to the model guidance. Next few months, November, models are opposite of the analogs above average in te temperatures of the, on the ECMWF across the whole country and it has above average precipitation from Texas through the upper Midwest Great Lakes. That'll probably be closer to reality. December it does show the something very close to what the analog show with above average temperatures in the east and below average temperatures, especially in the Southwest. It does extend a little bit further into the Northwest than the analog show though. And then December it's active from Texas through the East Coast. And then January is a little bit cooler than the analogs, but it does show the Northern US still warm and it's, and it's a bit cooler across the south. It just extends the north, sends the coolness a little bit further north into the central plains and Great Basin than the analogs do. And the precipitation, again, quiet along the west coast and active across the south and east. February, a colder month in the central U.S., a little bit warmer in the northeast, but not as much. So it is a little bit cooler than what you might might expect because usually you see these models should come up warm so that does give me a little bit of a pause well before you want to go too warm with the forecast um, again february shows for precipitation the most active area from texas through the east coast and then march it wants to be warm again and it's active across the central and southern part of the country compare that to the cfs and the cfs has nothing to do with cold ever for the most part, uh, November, December, January is orange colors and red colors, uh, well above average. So there you go, <laughs> about warm across the board on that model. And precipitation is a bit different. It's more active along the West Coast and not as much active, not as active across the central part of the country, November, December. And then uh, January, December, January, start to see precipitation increase across the East and the South, kind of like the ECMWF shows. And then February, still warm, the, some coolness may be sneaking into the Northeast, something to watch there. And then March, still above average with the exception of the East, the Mid Atlantic and Southeast Coast. Precipitation active across most of the country in February, the exception of the Great Lakes and the Ohio Valley. That's similar to the analogs. And then March active across the South, maybe not as much from the Ohio Valley into the Great Lakes, upper Midwest. Not too dissimilar to the analogs, although. Analogs may be a little bit more active, a little more active in what this shows. So with that, let me let's wrap this up into a seasonal forecast. We're going to bring in the closer, our fearless leader, Mr. Steve Strum. Steve, please take it away. All right, thank you, Nate, for all the uh, the the content and the information we're can kind of compiling here for our seasonal outlook, which I will now go into. So overall, the process again does 
take those analog years, the climate model guidance, looking at recent trends, and then seeing how all that compares to the long-term climatology to get our final forecast, which you can see here on a monthly basis. So our forecast for November is to, is to have generally near average temperatures across the eastern U.S. for the monthly average, but we don't expect the weather to actually be near normal for most of the time. We are, again, going to be seeing a shot of colder air moving in this weekend into early next week, and that's going to continue into early November. But then we could see a mid-month warm-up before possibly another cool down late in the month. Some of our sub-seasonal indicators suggest that we could see uh, another round of colder air move in sometime around the end of November or the start of December. So uh, lots of ups and downs uh, in the cards really for the next five or so weeks. And so that may average out to near normal for the Eastern US, but expect the volatility during that time frame. Again, December could start out colder than average across the Eastern US if we do see that round of cold air move in around the start of the month. But we do likely, uh, or we do expect a, a trend towards warmer weather for the middle of December. And typically, a lot of these uh, El Nino years have had a very mild back half of December. So uh, we do, at this point in time, anticipate that the year will end on a warmer note for most of the eastern half of the country. January is likely to average warmer than normal across the northern tier of the country, while the southern U.S. with that active storm track is more likely to be near or below average. Uh, the main uncertainty is going to be where that boundary ends up in terms of who's above and who's near or below. So that may vary north or south from what is shown, but the general trend should be warmer north and cooler south in terms of the anomalies. Again, February is a big wild card month here. Uh, we do likely, or we do expect to see more cooler uh, temperatures across the southeastern U.S. that month relative to December and January. How much cold air is present will again depend on how the El Nino evolves, the weaker it gets, and or the farther west it shifts during the winter season. Uh, that will determine how much cold air we likely see develop during the tail end of the winter season. So uh, again, a weaker El Nino or a, a more of a westward shift in the event would increase the risk for more cold for the uh, month of February especially, and in general, the last half of the winter season. And that would obviously bring more threats for snow and things of that nature across the Northeast as well, since we are likely going to have a lot of opportunities in terms of storm systems. And so if we do get more of that colder air moving in during February, that could combine to produce a, a very interesting end of the winter season. And that general pattern is likely to continue into March before we transition into a warmer spring pattern. And so generally a warmer Northwest and a cooler Southeast. Looking at the seasonal average, again, warm North and cooler South is a general regime. The Southeast, again, is more uncertain, likely starting warm in December, but again, February, if it does end up colder, could skew the seasonal average to near or below average for more of that part of the country. But the odds do favor the northern tier of the country, especially the Northwest and New England, uh, coming in warmer than normal for the three-month average. Now, in terms of the risks, uh, if we do see the El Nino stay strong throughout the entire winter season, that likely would result in a warmer February, in which case you would likely see most of the eastern half of the country average warmer than normal for the entire winter season, uh, all three months potentially. Uh, but again, if we do see the El Nino uh, trend weaker faster than expected during the winter season or shift farther west more than expected, then that would open the door for a colder second half of the winter season which uh, could result in more of the southern half of the country averaging colder than normal, again, mainly from the middle of January onward. Uh, that is a lower risk at this time, given that we are looking at another uh, strengthening phase of the current El Nino that should take us through November into December. And so at this point in time, the odds of it uh, significantly weakening by January and February to where that would that colder scenario would play out is a lower risk at that time. But again, it's still a few months off, obviously. And so there is still time for that to happen. Again, other notes here, the ECMWF model, which is normally a warm model, does show more cold this winter season across the central and southern U.S. So we'll have to watch for that. Again, uh, with that model as well, the bigger risk is for the, uh, the second half of the winter season. And if we do see the El Nino weekend, other factors such as the polar vortex will play an even larger role. Uh, some factors such as the QBO do favor a weaker polar vortex this year. And so if we do see the El Nino weaken enough to where it doesn't dominate the pattern, those factors will tend to play a larger role. In terms of how the heating degree days end up for this winter season, we are actually expecting this winter to average a little colder than the last four winters. You might not expect that based on the warm map, but 
you know, we have had a lot of warm winters lately, so uh, it does come in a little bit warmer than the, the previous four years, even with the warmer than normal forecast relative to the 30-year average. So uh, again, a lot of that will come down to February. If we do see a stronger El Nino and a warmer February, then likely we'll end up the same or a little bit cooler than, or a little bit warmer than the last four years. But if we do see that colder weather develop uh, during the tail end of the winter season, that could push us uh, as forecast here higher than the last four years, maybe even uh, a little higher than uh, that trend line uh, currently shows there. But overall, again, the main risk is really going to be that tail end of the of the winter, and that will kind of determine how things play out relative to recent years. Now, the table on the bottom left, one thing to note there is that if you look at the five-year average column, note that November and February have tended to be, in recent years, the coldest months relative to normal, with December being the warmest month relative to normal uh, in terms of recent years. Australia matches our forecast through February as well in terms of those, those overall trends. And that generally matches the El Nino trend as well. If you note from what uh, Nate showed with those analogs, December typically is the, the warm month. November has some risk for cold, and then typically the cold risk returns again in February. So uh, the, the five-year the five average trend kind of actually matches the El Nino trends, uh, even though we've had a lot of El Ninos in, in recent years. Now, looking at the precipitation forecast, this more or less kind of follows what Nate showed for the uh, analog composites. This, of course, is a blend of the analogs, the, the models, and, and long-term trends and so forth. But the overall idea, again, is for a wetter pattern across most of the southern half of the country for most of the winter months. There'll be more variability in the Great Lakes region with some wetter conditions possible early in the winter, followed by the general, generally drier trends for January onward. But the southern U.S. should generally see wetter than normal conditions for most of the winter season, as will the west and east coast, especially from January onward. So overall, a kind of a typical El Nino regime with a, a southern storm track driving a lot of those precipitation anomalies across that part of the country. And again, as Nate mentioned, that potential for more coastal storms, especially during the second half of the winter season. So that could bring that uh, risk for not only above average precipitation in general, but potentially above average snowfall in the portions of the East Coast, uh, especially during the second half of the winter season. So we'll be watching that very closely. Again, it will depend on how much cold air we see during that time frame. We're going to have a lot of opportunities for snowfall across the Northeast in terms of coastal storms during the uh, latter January, February into March period. And so if we can get cold air to sync up with one of those storms, the potential does exist for you know, a couple uh, significant snowstorms across the urban corridor of the Northeast if we can uh, find enough cold air to mix with those coastal storms. So our snowfall forecast does favor the Southwest to be snowier than average, as well as parts of the Mid-Atlantic and Appalachians, but generally less snow than the average across the Northern tier. Now, again, the caveat there is the higher risk for coastal storms could potentially produce more snowfall uh, for more of the Mid-Atlantic than indicated there uh, uh, especially as we head into February. And what may also be the case this year is that because of the generally milder trends for most of the winter season, we may actually see fewer snowfall events than average across places like New York City and Philadelphia. But because of those uh, coastal storm risks, it may be the case that the events that we do see, especially during the second half of the winter season, are pretty impactful. So it may be a case where we don't see a lot of individual events, but but the ones that we do see, a lot of those could be potentially more impactful with uh, not only, you know, maybe heavier snowfall, but with the coastal storms, you know, you have the higher winds and, and other features like that, which can kind of add to the overall impacts of the snowfall events when they do occur. Now, looking at the renewable side of things, this more or less matches the uh, precipitation outlook. Again, the West Coast with all those storms moving in there will bring more wind than average and those coastal storms on the East Coast during the second half of the winter will also increase overall wind speeds for that region as well. In between, kind of a mixed bag. Uh, the main area, though, uh, of suppressed winds this winter will likely be across the Great Lakes region into the Ohio Valley. Again, kind of matching up with the potential for drier conditions there. And solar across the southwest likely coming in lower than uh, normal this winter season with all the additional storm systems bringing a lot of cloud cover and precipitation obviously uh, reducing the amount of overall available sunlight coming through uh, during the course of the winter season. Now, looking elsewhere globally, you can see not only the northern U.S., but much of Europe and Asia is currently forecast to come in warmer than average, and those areas also likely wetter than average as well. But much like the eastern U.S., 
a lot of Europe and Western Asia, basically Western Russia into Europe has the potential to come in quite a bit colder for February as well if we do see the El Nino weaken or shift westward. And if we see the positive IOD pattern in the, in the Indian Ocean weaken, which currently has warmer water in the Western Indian Ocean and cooler water near Malaysia and Indonesia, if that pattern diminishes this winter along with a faster El Nino weakening, that would, like the eastern U.S., open the door for potentially a colder end of winter for that area as well. So kind of summing things up here for the U.S., again, the Northwest coming in warmer than average for this winter season overall. And we should see that warmer pattern really for most months of the winter season. Uh, drier conditions across the Rockies, but the immediate Northwestern coast could potentially see above average precipitation. But for the most part, most of the Southwest and California should be the main focus for the higher precipitation totals this winter season. And the pattern this year will, of course, allow for a lot of that to come in the form of snowfall for the higher elevation areas of California in the southwest as well. Uh, and then as we head to the eastern U.S., that will, of course, carry over into the southeast with the higher precipitation totals and the generally cooler trends as well, especially after December. Again, we're forecasting December to come in warmer than average across the southeast, but the other months to come in generally at or below normal. The north central U.S. has the highest chance to come in warmer than average for most of the winter months this year. And again, with uh, the storm track across the southern U.S., that should also translate into below average snowfall for those areas as well. For the northeast, again, the warmer start to December and then potentially the uh, increased risk for colder air and snowier conditions as we head into February, depending on how the El Nino situation evolves. But either way, uh, potentially quite a few coastal storms during the back half of the winter season. So things like coastal flooding and you know higher winds and, and heavy rains and flooding and those types of uh, impacts are possible, even if we don't see the snowfall, just because of the frequent storm systems that will be possible during that part of the winter season. So the key messages here, a strong El Nino will dominate for most of the winter season. Most of our indicators do favor the northern U.S. coming in warmer than average, but the southern half of the country could be colder than average for January through March especially, and again, likely heavier precipitation for those areas. Again, the coastal storm potential along the uh, mid-Atlantic and northeast corridor there is going to be a higher risk from basically midwinter onwards, so especially late January into March, we'll have to watch for that increased risk for that area. And that could translate to above normal snowfall for the Appalachians and portions of the Mid-Atlantic. So looking industry by industry here for the utilities, again, the warmer average, warmer than average temperatures for the Northern US should result in below average heating demand for the big population areas of the Midwest and Northeast. But the South will actually be colder than the last, uh, than last year, especially. And so we should see an increase in heating demand across the South relative to last year. But that active Southern uh, tra uh, storm track across the Southern US should result in not just overall higher precipitation totals, but also potentially uh, more severe weather events during the winter season down along the Gulf Coast, across Florida, down in those areas there. And uh, with those late season coastal storms, uh, again, the potential for coastal flooding, high wind events, and those uh, impacts will be possible for the East Coast. Now, looking at aviation, uh, since we do have the likely stronger jet stream across the southern U.S. this year and a weaker northern branch of the jet across the northern U.S., that will uh, kind of flip the wind situation around from what it normally is with stronger winds across the northern U.S. and weaker winds across the southern U.S., so that will be impacting uh, fuel usage and that kind of thing for aviation this winter season. Uh, IFR conditions will be more frequent across the south with the enhanced precipitation in those areas. Uh, but conversely, the northern U.S. will be seeing uh, more days uh, with either a high cloud gap or no clouds at all, and so better overall conditions for those areas there. But again, those coastal storms could potentially produce some uh, meaningful impacts for the northeast urban corridor during the second half of the winter season causing a, a number of events where we do see widespread major flight disruptions. Uh, transportation uh, outside of aviation, with the reduced snowfall across the Midwest and Northeast, at least through early winter, uh, that will reduce overall usage for chemicals and salt. But uh, again, potentially we could see an increase in that during the tail end of the winter season across the Northeast, and especially the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, lake effect snowfall events this year will likely in general, be less frequent than average given the overall patterns that we'll be seeing this year. However, because we do see uh, 
you know, overall a warm water temperature present across most of the Great Lakes now, and the warm weather should keep that warmer water in place throughout the winter season. If we do see a favorable event develop for lake effect snow this winter season, it could be like last year where we, did, where we didn't actually see that many individual lake effect snowfall events, but the ones we had were quite impactful, at least locally. And so the potential for a major you know, snowfall event in the, in the typical areas that get them around the Great Lakes is still possible this winter season. We'll likely just see fewer lake effect snowfall events than normal. Uh, again, late, uh, late season snowfall for the mid-Atlantic to New England will be a possibility with those coastal storms, which may impact conditions there quite a bit. And the rain across the south will have to watch for flash flooding and, of course, you know, severe weather impacts as well. And uh, one thing, too, with El Nino, because we do see warmer temperatures across the northern U.S., Oftentimes, instead of just seeing snowfall, we do have the risk for more uh, mixed precipitation events, so more sleet, more freezing rain could be a factor across the northern U.S. this year than normal. Now, kind of wrapping things up, wrapping things up here, looking at offshore events, uh, we likely will see a few interesting impacts this winter season with the southern track, or with the southern storm track, so that will lead to more frequent frontal passages across the Gulf of Mexico, so more events where we have higher winds and thus higher wave highs across the Gulf than typical. Also, the southern stream or active southern stream will produce the potential for more frequent severe weather events as well. So, we'll have to watch for storm systems that move across the Gulf this uh, winter season that, you know, have more lightning and winds and things like that, which could impact coastal conditions. But at the same time, the active weather will reduce sea fog in general. So, we won't see as many long periods with calm conditions where those foggy weather patterns can really get going and settle in for a long period of time. And so while sea fog will still, of course, happen this winter season uh, because of the active pattern, those shouldn't be as of long duration as typical. So you may see it for a couple of days and then a storm comes through, sweeps everything out, and you get a couple of days where we have much better visibilities and then maybe fog comes back in for a time. So kind of more back and forth and less uh, long duration fog events this winter season than usual. And so with that, I will pass things on here to Troy, and he can take a look in more detail at the overall energy impacts uh, for this winter season. Thanks so much, Stephen. So um, hi, everyone. My name is Troy Vincent, and I'm a senior energy market analyst here at DTN. And I'm just going to kind of contextualize this weather forecast for you and tell you what this outlook implies for oil and gas markets. So, as I'm sure you all are quite well aware, over the past couple of winters, many regions of the globe have been faced with low inventories of many of the fuels needed to keep homes and critical infrastructure warm and well lit and at prices that consumers and economies can afford. For Europe, the rearranging of trade flows following the uh, invasion of Ukraine from Russia um, and the build out of new LNG import capacity has been impressively quick in the wake of that invasion. Um, and when you combine that with this demand weakness uh, that we've seen over the past year there, shortages of energy commodities around the globe are easing. But it's really hard to overstate how important uh, the favorable weather conditions have been for this easing of shortages and the bringing about of lower natural gas prices in particular over the past year. That said, as I say here, you know, weather has been both causing and relieving stress um, in, in energy markets because Weather developments have also caused a tremendous uh, amount of stress on energy markets over the past couple of years, but particularly on the oil side, uh, which is a, a bit anomalous because uh, it's typically always the focus is on natural gas. You know, the extremely disparate impacts uh, for the oil market compared to the natural gas market in recent winters has been lost on many people, uh, but it should simply just not be overlooked. Uh, last winter's warmth in the U.S. and Europe, and Europe uh, really helped lead natural gas prices in the U.S. to plummet from a little over $7 in MMBTU down to $2 by the end of the winter earlier this year. And despite above average warmth for the balance of the winter, an extreme cold snap that worked its way into the Gulf Coast refining complex and resulted in lasting damage caused counter seasonal declines in refined fuel stocks and left the global oil product market far tighter this year than it would have otherwise been. Uh, it, you know, and from my perspective, if, if it had not been for the unfavorable weather developments uh, for oil markets, we would likely be seeing oil prices about 20% lower than where they are today, and or Saudi Arabia having to do far more, uh, keep keeping far more oil off the market than what they currently are to, to see prices uh, averaging where they where they are today. 
So while this is a US centric webinar today as both an example of how influential we winter weather developments are on natural gas markets. And as a reminder that with the US exporting ever more natural gas, the domestic price is increasingly tied to global developments. I, I must mention that, you know, last winter's weather in Europe, it was the second warmest winter on record there uh, across the continent at large. And this couldn't have come at a better time for European policymakers, European economies and consumers. You know, with Russian pipeline supply cut off, Europe began, began leaning really heavily on LNG imports, uh, particularly from the US, as you can see here on the chart to the left. And when combined with this extremely mild winter, this, this meant that natural gas storage levels in Europe never breached the 50% of capacity levels at the end of winter earlier this year, as you can see on the chart to the right. Uh, this really set the stage for the EU storage situation that we now find ourselves in, which is to say the highest ever on record for the seasonal period at nearly 100% uh, full heading into the winter heating season there. And this has brought uh, natural gas prices at the, the Dutch benchmark TTF down from $140 in MMBTU last winter to currently uh, around $49 in MMBTU. Now, kind of turning back more to North America and the US, thankfully for Europe, they have an ally in the US that is not only the world's largest producer of natural gas, but that is also lifting exports uh, to new record highs. And the, the spread between US and global prices in Asia and Europe currently is widening as we enter the winter and, and the heating season. And LNG exports are expected to average nearly 10% higher year on year this winter from the US. Now, last winter, as production was pushing to new record highs, exports from the Freeport terminal were shut in following the accident there. And with last winter coming in as I believe the seventh warmest on a gas weighted heating degree basis in the last 40 years, you can see why natural gas prices really melted down last winter. Similarly to the situation in Europe, our end of winter inventory levels earlier this year put us on track to be well stocked for the rest of the year. So even with record strong exports, with US natural gas exports really constrained by export capacity, which means right, no matter how high prices get in Europe or Asia, we can only send them so much of our production based on export capacity. And, and given this constraint and amid the record strong production, U.S. natural gas inventories are expected to uh, be about 133 BCF higher at the end of this winter season than we ended last winter with. And I'm sorry to bore folks uh, uh, with a bit of kind of winter heating basics if this is really nothing new to you, but it is incredibly important to consider that winter heating, the, you know, the kind of broader winter heating dynamics between different regions of the country when you're considering the impact of winter weather outlooks on various winter heating fuels. So the, the two most important points being that heating oil and propane are, are regionally concentrated and make up a very small percentage of home heating. And almost 90% of homes are primarily heated by natural gas and electricity. And, and I phrase it like that, say 90% of homes are you know, primarily heated by natural gas and electricity. I'm phrasing it like that specifically because natural gas fire generation accounts for around 40% of total electricity generation in the US at the moment which means that natural gas dominates both direct heating and electricity generation, uh, which then, you know, of course, later becomes heating in people's homes. <laughs> um, in, in their latest short-term energy outlook, the EIA is forecasting Henry Hub spot prices to average around $3.39 in MMBTU this winter. That's down 14% year over year. And we believe that, you know, that that, that makes a lot of sense. We, we, can see, uh, we can see that happening easily and in fact, if this winter skews warmer, that prices uh, could easily be, you know, 25 cents in MMBTU lower than that. So with natural gas playing such a large role in fueling the grid and direct winter heating, as we described a moment ago, you know, winter weather plays a really dominant role in the pace of natural gas demand and therefore inventory changes in prices. And while we agree with the EIA's winter fuels outlook that we are likely to see expenditures on natural gas this winter drop a little over 20% from last winter, the price range potentials amid the 10% warmer and 10% colder scenarios that you can see here really speak to how big of an impact winter weather can play. With the expectations for this year's winter weather to be dictated by the strength of the El Nino, as you heard earlier here on the, on the call, you know, 
those heating with heating oil and propane should see price relief closer to this 10% warmer scenario uh, from my perspective, given that the northern and central plains, as well as the northeast U.S., uh, looks set to you know see their temperature skewed higher by the El Nino compared to the rest of the country. And uh, as I said a moment ago, as for the commodity price of natural gas, I expect we'll see an average around $3.40 an MMBTU. That's down from around $4 average last winter. And like I said a moment ago, I think we could even see that potentially uh, come in a little lower, uh, depending on how, how warm the winter shapes up. Now, while winter weather outlooks are almost always focused on natural gas, I would be remiss if I didn't take a few minutes to discuss winter weather impacts on oil and refined product markets as well. Not only because that's really kind of my chief area of focus, but also because the past two winters have truly been unprecedented from the perspective of the, the winter weather's impact on oil refining. It, it really all started in February of 2021 with uh, what was deemed winter storm Uri at the time. And then late last December, the, the Gulf Coast was hit once again with this short-lived but extreme incursion of, of Arctic air. Uh, and you can see both of these uh, in various image examples here on this slide. Now, with all that's been kind of happening in the world over the past couple of years, it, it's really easy to forget how big of an impact these winter weather disruptions have had on oil markets and consumer prices. Uh, these winter storms were both extremely costly, not only to directly to refiners, but also created widespread impacts throughout the global economy and for consumers around the world. You can see here on this, this is uh, refinery runs or gross inputs into U.S. refiners. And, and all these, you know, these kind of highlighted ellipses you can see here uh, are really, you know, graphically displaying the, the winter storm impacts there. So even ignoring the, the impact from uh, the prior winter, from that winter storm Uri, which led to a staggering drop in fuel stocks in and of itself. But just looking at last year, based on my estimates, end of winter diesel stocks would have been about 22 million barrels higher and gasoline stocks would have been about 30 million barrels higher moving into the spring of 2023 if it weren't for those winter heat, winter weather you know, events taking refiners offline for an extended period this, this past winter. So just like with natural gas, refined fuels typically have seasonal periods in which they're building and seasonal periods in which they're drawing. And with two consecutive winters of refined fuels production being severely hampered by winter weather developments, this has kept domestic and global refined products markets far tighter than what they otherwise would have been and therefore supporting higher prices. So this uh, the little ellipse that you can see highlighted on this chart, this is uh, Arbov or gasoline futures. Uh, you know, the, the extreme freeze in Texas uh, last December that I just described marked the bottom for gasoline prices and, and with refinery repairs from the winter lingering for many months, causing a prolonged uh, spring refinery maintenance season, the impact on fuel so supply and prices has been really seen for the entirety of, of this year. So the main focus for oil analysis surrounding winter is usually around heating oil demand. Um, distillate fuel oil demand, uh, of which heating oil is a component, is currently around 5% below year ago levels and 3.4% below 2019 levels for the seasonal period. Um, last year, as you can see here on the chart, the, the warm winter and high heating oil prices led distillate fuel oil demand to peak in October rather than continue higher as is seasonally normal through January. And this year, with row crop harvest currently ahead of schedule, uh, which could mean an early end to the harvest season, uh, in, you know, in, in implied demand. And with the freight sector under pressure and El Nino expected to limit home heating oil demand in the Northeast, we expect U.S. distillate fuel oil demand to disappoint once again this winter. So in total, what does this winter outlook really mean for oil prices? Well, while there are certainly many other things happening in the world, as we all know, that, that could easily upend this, this winter weather's impact, the price risk associated with the current winter weather outlook is certainly skewed to the bearish side. Uh, we believe that the, the most important factor will be El Nino significantly reducing the risk of Arctic air excursions and freezing temperatures along the Gulf Coast and uh, limited risk to Gulf Coast refineries and lower heating oil demand in the New England area should combine and kind of lead us to this first winter of normal refining activity since 2020, 
and help the U.S. leave the winter with more normal and less tight refined fuel balances, and in particular for gasoline. So this should bring some relief for, for oil, oil markets and, and prices uh, globally. All right, guys. Well, that's, that's all I've got. So I'll hand it back to you, Andrea. Thank you, Troy. Um, I did see some questions come through the chat. Um, Nathan, Stephen, Troy, uh, are you able to see those questions um, or would you uh, like? Yes, I've compiled some questions and uh, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll ask some questions of our of our panel here. And the first one to come through here that I want to address is historical data has shown that previous strength of El Nino has a large impact on average temperature and precipitation across the US. So the moderate El Ninos and the strong El Ninos, which are defined as one, a strong defined above 1.5 C, moderate one to 1.5 C above average, had differences, you know, large differences in resulting temperatures. So the, the analog maps that you are showing take the strength into account, or this are you just showing an average of L uh, of all El Nino events. And I can take that one. Um, our, 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 analog, uh, our analog years include a mix of strong and weak ones, just in case our strong El Nino forecast doesn't work out the way we quite think it will. So um, uh, many, and we, we weigh them too. So they're not just a, a straight average, but some of the uh, stronger ones are weighted a little bit higher than some of the weaker ones. So that's how the analog composite is is made here. So um, years like 1982, 1997, 2015 are going to weigh a little bit higher than some of the weaker years um, because of this, because of where we are at in the, in the year right now, we're already from a weekly standpoint above the strong El Nino threshold. So when we, so when we talk about uh, the odds of where the most of the winter is going to, going to end up, we believe we're going to end up more on the stronger side than on the weaker side. So the forecast is skewed in that direction. And the analog years are, are weighted, you know, those kind of years are weighted higher. And uh, another question here about slide 35, which was our top six snowfall anomalies slide. They were asking how the uh, snow anomalies are defined, They're all years versus El Nino years. And, Snowfall, like every other variable on here, that's it's compared to the 1991 to 2020 30 year average. So uh, all anomalies, no matter what they are, are for, are against that that 30 year average. So yeah, I got one for Steve here. What do you predict for November, especially for California in the West? Well. November is always a, a pretty tricky month, you know, for for any winter season because we're not fully into the uh, the winter regime in terms of the uh, you know things like El Nino and what they're impacting. Um, there's a lot of variability. You have late season hurricanes or, or rather typhoons in the Western Pacific that can cause short term, large scale perturbations in the pattern and, and cause a lot of variability. So November ends up being a lot more variable uh, compared to other winter months in terms of the impacts that you sometimes see. But currently, the uh, based on the current pattern that we're expecting, uh, California should see generally at or below average precipitation overall. Uh, the general pattern will in at least initially favor a, a western ridge and then the eastern trough, and then we could see that pattern return again late in the month. So there may be a window of time, middle of the month, where we, we do see an increase in precipitation there. So, but, but overall, because of the uh, quieter start and end to the month there, we may end up uh, averaging a little bit below average in terms of precipitation and, and thus uh, snowfall for uh, for the Sierra. But I mean, odds are we'll see, you know, at least one event at some point during the uh, month of November that does bring, you know, widespread, uh, you know, snowfall to the Sierra and so forth. Yeah, that, I definitely agree with that. And th that November is just probably going to be that type of month where you just can't get one regime to lock in. Lots of ups and downs. So we'll go through some quiet and then more active periods. So, yep. It definitely fits the pattern as, a, as our El Nino strengthens here during the month of November. All right, uh, I've got, got some more here. Um, you mentioned the chance of coastal storms. What areas were you referring to along the coast? And I can take that one. When we talk about coastal storms, we're more or less talking about the East Coast. So some of these storms that could develop either 
in the, either off in the south of the Gulf of Mexico or somewhere off of the eastern seaboard, the Mid Atlantic, and then come north eastward into the into New England or off the coast even. And um, sometimes those are referred to as nor'easters. Depends on your depends on your nomenclature where you're you know where you're from and stuff like that. But um, those are the types of storms that you know they, they can produce heavier impacts across the south with rain, thunderstorms, and then snow on the colder side across sometimes in the north or sometimes it's in the interior. Never can tell. So they come in all shapes and sizes. But when we refer to coastal storms in the along the east coast, that's they could they could be anywhere along the coast or are all along the coast depending on their track. So um, but we do think there will be more opportunities for those types of systems this year, especially as we get into the latter half of the winter season, February in particular. We have time for one more, I think so. Slide 39, uh, the, the discussion said the, pol the polar vortex wasn't an issue, but the message looked different for California. So can you clear that up? Is that correct? And I think I, you wanna take that one, Steve? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the, the big impact with the polar vortex this year is just that typically when we have a strong El Nino event, the the uh, El Nino can, tends to dominate the pattern and it, it makes it a little bit harder for other factors like the polar vortex to have an you know, outsized influence on, on things. So if we do see the, uh, you know, the El Nino weekend, then the, the potential for the polar vortex to have a, a greater impact uh, is greater. Now, uh, the one slide did show that uh, with the analogs that there was a potentially a, a, a higher risk for you know, colder air and you know, having a trough off the west coast and that kind of thing. Uh, into the uh, eastern Pacific Ocean, and, and the main impact with that is not that you would see a lot of cold air or you know Arctic air moving into California, but that would tend to drive the storm track into California. So it would tend to create sort of that Pineapple Express pattern where you see the uh, strong flow of, of moisture and, and you know associated storm systems coming from around down by Hawaii up into uh, into California. So those obviously can still bring tremendous snowfall to the Sierra, and they usually do. But but uh, the general impact would be of that to keep the overall pattern favorable for driving a lot of storm systems into into California during the course of the of, of the winter season. But in terms of cold air making impacts into the U.S. Uh, because of the polar vortex, that that is one of those things where typically it's it's more likely to happen if the El Nino weakens. But if El Nino stays in that strong state that it's expected to be in at the start of the winter, that usually is strong enough to. To kind of control everything and dominate the uh, the pattern during the winter season. Thank you very much, Steve. And I think now yeah, we're two after the hour. Unfortunately, I think we're going to have to bring it back over to Andrea. Close up shop here for the for this webinar. Andrea. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us today um, in our uh, 2023 uh, winter season outlook. Um, we will be sending out the recording. Thank you and have a great day.